In 1917, the October Revolution overturned the centuries of feudalism in Russia, established the world's first communist country, and inspired a revolutionary spirit in people around the globe. 100 years on, what does the October Revolution mean for the world today? How did it impact China's own revolution and social development? While the collapse of the Soviet Union marked a triumph of capitalism, 10 years of recovery from the financial crisis have seen renewed interest in Karl Marx's influential book, Capital. Is capitalism being challenged today? What are the alternatives? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Mr. Zhou Shuchun, Editor-in-Chief of China Daily. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, the uh, October Revolution occurred 100 years ago, so we're, we're going to mark the 100th anniversary. But many who observed the process uh, of October Revolution pointed out that this major event of last century was actually a um, mistake and at least premature. Do you agree? Uh, absolutely not. The revolution is a product of the given uh, special circumstances of the time. Uh, it's no accident, no mistake, no premature birth or no slip of pen by the God, as some people put it, is something inevitable. Um, it just uh, happened. History has uh, a rule of itself. Um, hypothesis doesn't work with history, especially not with a kind of hindsight perspective. So what do you think of the impact and significance of the October Revolution? I think it's up to the Russian people to make the assessment. We can't speak for them. Uh, and I suppose it's something uh, for them to brood over for a long time to come. But uh, from an outsider point of view and to take a long range kind of historical outlook, uh, probably we can draw some parallel. Uh, nowadays we talk about uh, the miracle of China. Uh, wasn't there a kind of a Soviet miracle back then? Uh, the country rose to power, rose to the status of uh, one of the two superpowers of the world. The only one to challenge, to counterweight, uh, to compete, a match with the United States. And uh, the Soviet Union was the backbone against the Nazis uh, in the Second World War. So uh, what would have been the outcome of the war if this revolution never happened? So it's kind of a historic, it's epoch making, and uh, history is to be respected. With the end of the Cold War in 1991 and the disintegration of the Soviet Union accordingly, there came a wave of re-examining history. Francisco Fukuyama, a political scientist from the United States, wrote a book called The Last Man and the End of History, mm. announcing the triumph of Western capitalism. What, what do you make of his theory on the so-called post-ideological world order? What does that mean for the rebuilding of uh, a triumphant China which vows to rejuvenate the dream of uh, being a great China? Uh, I think there is no end uh, to history. Uh, if the idea of the end of history theory is for socialism to fade out of history, it didn't happen. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mr. Francis Fukuyama uh, re revised his theory. Uh, he said something uh, to the effect afterwards. Uh, the end of history seemed to have been postponed. And later on, he said that uh, Western democracy might not be the end uh, of the evolution of, of human history. So uh, there have been uh, revisits to the theory. And uh, this, as you said, as you put it uh, correctly, it has something to do with the success of, of China. The story of China, the Chinese experience shows that there is the possibility of modernization uh, with a different approach. 
like in, in the form of socialism with Chinese characteristics. And this shows uh, Western democracy is not the answer for all countries seeking a path of modernization. What do you think of the relationship between China's revolution and the October Revolution? Uh, as we often said, uh, it's the October Revolution, or rather to put it more vividly, it's the cannons or ban of, of the cannons from the Aurora cruiser that brought Marxism to, to China. Uh, China might have stumbled or stepped upon the correct, the right path of development, but there is a clear, direct link between the October Revolution and the Chinese Revolution. And I think that is the beginning, the starting point of this long pro uh, protracted process to make Marxism Chinese. Yes? Uh, and China of today uh, has traveled thus far, arriving where it is from that particular point in history. Uh, from October Revolution to the collapse of the Soviet Union, the 20th century may have witnessed uh, a war between socialism and capitalism. It seems that capitalism uh, has taken the upper hand. Uh, how do you assess the development of a capitalism? Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's the 20th century is a century uh, of uh, socialism versus capitalism, but uh, it can be called a, a century of war uh, and the revolution. And uh, this reminds me of the book uh, written by Eric Hobsbawm uh, with the title, the, the Age of Extremes, A Short History of the 20th Century. And in the book, he asked 12 people to give what he called a bird's eye view of the 20th century. Uh, one of them is uh, Ehudi Menuhin, the violinist. Uh, I'm not sure whether what, what he has in mind, what he had in mind when he said this, but this is the best I've read of as conclusion of the 20th century. And he said, if I had to sum up the 20th century to raise, this, uh, to raise the greatest hoax cons ever conceived by humanity, and destroyed all illusions and ideals. Uh, as for the as development of capitalism, I think, uh, to quote Marx, Karl Marx, on one hand, uh, capitalism or the bourgeoisie uh, should have the responsibility of creating a new basis, new material basis for a new world. Uh, so it, it could have been s something of an unconscious tool of history unconscious to of historical progress. But on the other hand, it's like a magi magician who cannot control the devils he can draw up from the magic box or bottle, like uh, the financial crisis. It's something capitalism is not ready to deal with. In the immediate aftermath of the Cold War, a late uh, President of the Russian Federation, Mr. Boris Yeltsin, learned uh, a lot from the advice uh, from uh, America introducing the shock therapy. Russia seems to be still struggling with the aftermath and consequences of the shock therapy, whilst China has uh, made a rapid progress in and transformed its economy into the second biggest one. What do you make of the gradualist approach of the Chinese uh, road in modernizing both its economy? and society compared with the uh, devastating consequences that beset the Russian Federation up till today? Uh, yes, uh, we don't have to make uh, simplistic com comparisons between the two countries or, di or different approaches uh, to develop the economy. But anyway, uh, China is doing very good or far better uh, compared with the rest of the world it shows that China has uh, uh, chosen the correct path suitable for its own uh, conditions, nationalist, national conditions, realities of China. And this is uh, uh, the best uh, we have learned from history. We don't go, we don't jump on conclusions, we don't adopt a, a textbook approach or 
copy anybody else. We just explore our own way of modernization. The core issue concerning China's uh, gradualist approach in modernizing our own economy, I'm afraid, is uh, not to radically privatize the economy. We have adopted a mixture of both public ownership and private ownership. Look at the reform of the SOE, state-owned enterprise. What can you tell about the, uh, this formidable part of our economy? And do you think there is still a strong relevance for the SOE to be an integral part of the Chinese economy? It's part of the idea of, uh, of uh, public ownership, which is the backbone uh, of the economy as a whole. But uh, be, be behind that is, uh, is the Chinese way of doing things. It's the beauty of the Chinese culture to learn all the, to ex absorb all the, the best elements learned from different parts of the world, all parts of the world. Uh, for example, uh, people used to say that uh, to combine market economy with uh, uh, socialism is like uh, uh, to have bamboo grafted on a tree, uh, saying it wouldn't work, but it's well done in China. Yeah, it seems uh, renowned economist Li Yifu quite agrees with you about uh, combining the two, a planned economy with the strong elements of the market economy. But the point is why uh, European Union and the United States still refuse to grant China the uh, market economic status. But you are watching Dialogue with Mr. Zhou Shuchun, Editor-in-Chief of China Daily. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us, please. Welcome back, Mr. Zhou. Um, people like uh, Francisco Fukuyama, whom we discussed earlier in the first part of the show, uh, seem to reach a consensus that unless and until we are able to combine with the liberal democracy, with the liberal market economy, the economy of China, or indeed in other developing countries, won't be a big success. However, look at what happened 10 years ago, the financial crisis in Wall Street. Right. An article of Financial Times a couple of weeks back said, well, uh, the failure of uh, Soviet communism uh, which was initiated 100 years ago, seemed to join hand with the collapse of a liberal uh, or um, new liberalism that is characterized by market economy in the West. Uh, isn't a coincidence. So what do you think of uh, the uh, uh, commemoration of these two major events in the context of uh, setbacks of uh, communism of last century? What do you make of the financial crisis? that we witnessed 10 years ago in the United States? I think it's a good idea to draw a uh, parallel between the two events, uh, the October Revolution and the financial crisis. They are both events of the uh, uh, most important events uh, of the century, or centuries respectively. Uh, they are like uh, kind of two thick books to be read and reread from time to time and debate to be played from time to time, uh, despite the passage of times. Uh, people won't have absolute consensus about the events. Uh, and, uh, for example, the financial crisis. Uh, people learn from the crisis. Uh, for example, uh, as a part of the discussion about uh, how to build a better world, we have to re-examine some of the essential relations like uh, uh, in the case of the financial crisis, the virtual economy uh, versus the real economy, uh, the market uh, versus the government, or uh, rather the invisible hand uh, versus the visible head, and equality versus efficiency, or rather the rich few versus uh, the poor many, and uh, probably uh, Keynesianism versus neoliberalism, and uh, in the broader sense, uh, probably socialism versus capitalism. We have to re-examine uh, the whole set of theories. Whatever the ideological uh, differences uh, between uh, Soviet Union and the United States, we are looking at the relationship between the government and the market. Today, it seems we still enjoy uh, 
very strong central government as opposed to the uh, visible hand of the market economy. So, as I, may I just go back very quickly to the refusal by both the European Union and the United States to accept China as a full-fledged market economic status. Today, China wants to go its own way by not giving up the central planning. So what do you think of the industrial policy of the Chinese authorities in navigating our own course independently as compared with, uh, say, the financial derivatives and the free market economy in the West? And this free market economy wreaked havoc with the world back in 2007, the financial meltdown, of course. Uh, I think uh, if there is any kind of consensus about as to why the financial crisis happened, took place at all, uh, people largely agree uh, it's the bankruptcy of new liberalism, uh, which is the culprit, I think, for the financial crisis. And uh, I can quote uh, a headline uh, from one of the American newspapers, I think, uh, saying that uh, we are all Chinese, meaning uh, Chinese practice, uh, kind of s elements of socialism were introduced to deal with the financial crisis. And uh, there was analysis that the President George W. Bush uh, would be remembered as the American president to have introduced socialism to Wall Street, the stronghold of capitalism. So what can you say? Uh, I, I think we have, we have to adapt to the new realities of the world. It's not just black and white. It's we have to learn from the painful experiences to reform uh, people's theories or set textbook theories. Well, what do you make of the basic hallmarks of a capitalism and a market economy? Is it about rule of law, level playing field, what else? Uh, in terms of economics, I think it, it depends on where you, you stand. Uh, uh, in terms of economics, I think it's, uh, it's uh, free market, of course, and and at the same time, it's uh, production driven by capital uh, seeking to expand constantly in this regard of uh, the limitation of consumption on the part of, cons of consumption, on the part of the, uh, of the masses. It's kind of overproduction versus uh, limited consumption, if I can say that. Mr. Zhou, in the wake of uh, the global financial crisis, Karl Marx's book Capital staged a comeback in public imagination. Are people finding explanations in this book, which was first published 150 years ago? As uh, Francis Wing, uh, the British, uh, renowned British journalist, author of uh, Da Capital, a biography, uh, said, uh, Karl Marx was never buried under the rubble of the Berlin Wall. He is very much alive, and his relevance is only beginning to be felt. And he could be the most influential thinker of the 21st century. And if you read Economics by Paul Samuelson, he quoted another philosopher of Britain, that is Isaiah Berlin, and he said, uh, no thinker of the 19th century has had so direct, so deliberate, and so powerful an influence on mankind as Karl Marx. So it shows the relevance of the book and the thinker. President Xi Jinping uh, said over and over that China is increasingly confident in providing a Chinese solution to mm -hmm. uh, a humanitarian search of uh, better social institutions. So what's your understanding of China's solution? Uh, probably uh, on this uh, point, we can go back to the October, October Revolution. Uh, I think what China is doing, uh, the Chinese Revolution, Chinese reform and opening, uh, have been part of those uh, efforts to build a better society. Yeah. Uh, 
and uh, today uh, we, we are doing better uh, uh, than most of the countries. I think shows uh, that uh, the system uh, behind uh, this uh, miracle of China is, uh, is very telling uh, to, to the world. Uh, we are doing great, uh, and we are doing great not for some wrong reason. And uh, the success, the story of China's success could not sustain without a good system. Yes. We, we have our own problems, and of course, uh, we, we solve our own problems and we navigate our own course in front of a watchful world audience, mm -hmm. uh, uh, most of which are not quite sure as to whether we're going to succeed eventually. But uh, do you think uh, the so-called China model can be copied elsewhere around the world? Uh, first of all, I think since the adoption of uh, socialism, uh, dating back 100 years with the October Revolution, uh, 97 years with the birth of the Communist Party of China, uh, 68 years with the founding of New China, and uh, 39 years with the reform and opening, the idea, the theory, has transformed fundamentally and uh, profoundly the nation, the destiny of the nation and the country. But however, I think uh, uh, China uh, is not seeking to impose its own values, belief system, practice upon other people. Uh, China is always ready to learn from other people. I think uh, that is uh, really the uh, exactly the secret of the success of China. That is uh, the country's ability to learn, uh, learning abilities. That's w what we call a learning inclined party, a learning inclined society, a learning inclined uh, country, uh, the most reliable and effective foundation and weapon uh, for facing up to the challenges of the world. Five years ago, President Xi Jinping, when he first took office, uh, raised the slogan of uh, ushering the China dream and rejuvenating the uh, right. Chinese civilization. He also went further to put forward the idea of a building a community of a common destiny. Mm -hmm. The core part of this concept, uh, I'm afraid, is uh, the introduction of a co-prosperity and to be inclu right. inclusive in constructing the Belt and the Road Initiative. Exactly. What do you think of the feasibility? Uh, on uh, the one hand, I think uh, uh, globalization constitutes the kind of cradle for this uh, uh, community of common fate, common destiny for mankind. Uh, the new material basis is out there, out of the process of globalization. So it's not uh, the wishful thinking on the part of China. On the other hand, I think it's in the genes of the Chinese culture, the Chinese uh, civilization to build a world of harmony. Uh, today, China is the second largest economy of the world is considered more responsible for the well-being of the world. And it's time for China to share more of its ideas, solutions, plans uh, for building a better world. Perhaps it is a, a, a golden age. It is great times uh, for redistribution of uh, wealth and assets right. throughout the world in what we call the implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative. The last question is very much about um, uh, the rivalry, if any, between capitalism and the communism, because uh, many scholars uh, uh, want to be a prophet in outlining what's going to happen next uh, in the age of globalization. But uh, by the end of the day, we would find ourselves repeating the same question concerning the competition between different ideologies with uh, uh, communist uh, communism and e uh, Western capitalism mm. uh, being the key players in the arena. Yes, I refer to the uh, to the kind of anecdote about uh, President Bush re being remembered as as the one to introduce uh, socialism in, uh, to Wall Street. Uh, the argument sh uh, served to to say that there could be competition uh, going on, but I think as far as China is concerned. Uh, China will only mind its own business, focusing on uh, things of its own, and uh, it's not seeking to bring about the destruction of other people. Uh, rather, uh, instead, we seek to uh, develop 
uh, we see common development, uh, it's the Chinese belief to help others achieve and establish what one self hopes to achieve and establish. So I, I'm afraid, I think, we are not seeing a world of clash between different sets of theories. Instead, it's going to be a world uh, where different uh, culture, different uh, uh, schools of thoughts, different systems exist and develop at the same time. Well, ironically, you have praised President Bush, Bush uh, Jr., twice uh, throughout the half an hour show. But he's the guy who tends to look at things in black and white terms, actually. We live in a world uh, which is not uh, governed by the zero-sum game. That's perhaps uh, the uh, crucial point of what President, of what Mr. Zhou Shuchun said uh, in his analysis about the contrast and the comparison between communism and Westernism when we commemorate the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution and the 10th anniversary of the financial meltdown. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.